Hello everybody! It is that strange period in between Christmas and New Year's when my sleep schedule is crazy, I'm being lazy about everything, and I'm not exactly sure what day it is. And I think that is a perfect time to do a book haul because I don't have to think too hard while doing this. Allow, allow me a bit of laziness, please. Um, and I have acquired a stack of beautiful books since the end of October. This isn't everything I've acquired, but they are the interesting, intriguing, and beautiful editions of things that I wanted to show you. So these are things that I have bought myself, been sent by publishers, or received as gifts from the end of October through Christmas. First up is The Stone in the Skull by Elizabeth Bear. This is the first book in a new series called The Lotus Kingdoms, which is set in the same world and I think roughly the same time period as her Eternal Sky trilogy, which was some really great and a little bit unusual fantasy. Since I haven't read it, I can't tell you my own summary of it, so I'm just going to admire the cover. The cover of this book is excellent! <laughs> There's something about it. I feel like it's perfectly balanced. And I particularly like the typography of the title. It goes with the artwork. Um, the artwork is by Richard Anderson, yes. Um, and I've seen his artwork on some other books and I really like it. When you look at it from afar, you can see the shape. When you look up very close, it is very, um, it's got like all these brush strokes. It's very angular looking in some way. You probably can't see it super well on camera. Um, I really like it. It's not what I would usually say is my type of artwork, but it's perfect here. Beautiful books, what can you say? <laughs> Next up is Penrick's Mission by Lois McMaster Bujold. This is one of the Penrick and Desdemona novellas, which is a series set in her world of the five gods, though it's its own storyline, its own time period, unconnected to any of her other books and stories set in the universe. I absolutely love them. I've read all of them that are, are currently out. I've decided to collect as many as I possibly can when they come out in print form. Um, Subterranean Press has been eating up the print rights as soon as the um, ebooks come out, and then six months later I will get <laughs> my pre-order of the latest hardcover edition. If you've never heard of Subterranean Press, they do limited edition, signed, collector's editions of um, science fiction and fantasy books. They are pricey, but they're very high quality and quality quite limited. You usually get like a thousand in a print run or something. These are completely worth it in my opinion. They they are pricey like I said, but um, I am particularly in love with the covers that they're doing for this novella series. They are all by Lauren Saonge, and I know I've probably said her name wrong again even though many of you have tried to teach me how to say it correctly. Um, I love her artwork. I've loved all the book covers I've seen by her, um, and I'm particularly pleased that they keep using her for um, the artwork for this series. It's really great, and if you like fantasy and you want some bite size reads, I would very much recommend this series. This next one isn't so much a beautiful book as it is an interesting one, which is fitting because it is like number 52 in a series called Conversation Pieces from Aqueduct Press. This is Monteverde, Memoirs of an Interstellar Linguist by Lola Robles, translated by Lawrence Schimmel. Um, I ran across this when I was looking for a speculative fiction written by women that's been translated into English, and I'm very intrigued not only by the book, but also by this conversation pieces line. Um, like I said, there are over 50 of them now, and there's a list at the beginning, and a ton of these sound really interesting by authors that I've wanted to try or that I know already like. Um, so this, this whole thing could be very interesting. I could really dive into this. This says, Terran scholar Rachel Monteverde journeys to Anuk, a paradisiacal planet famous for both its beaches and the generosity and joy of life of its nomadic inhabitants. The Anukians are not the only people on the planet, however. Rachel is eager to meet the Phidia, a cave-dwelling people who share a congenital condition that makes them blind. Rachel's relentless determination to communicate with them despite the Anukians' dismissal and the Phidia's secretiveness will yield more than she ever hoped for." Um, of course, the comparison is already made on the back, but it reminds me immediately of Ursula Le Guin, the type of story that she would tell. Also a little bit about um, Dark Orbit by Carolyn Ives Gilman, probably something about communication and people who are blind, because Dark Orbit was very much about 
um, optics and perception and stuff. But of course, this hits all of my buttons. It sounds like it's kind of feminist science fiction in the vein of Le Guin, whom I love. It's got alien species, communication, linguistics, anthropology. What more could I ask for? Next up is The Long List Anthology Volume 3, edited by David Steffen. If you're not familiar with the idea of this anthology series, it basically reprints uh, short fiction from the three short fiction categories from the Hugo Awards, the pieces that didn't make it to the shortlist but which are revealed to be on the long list after the awards are given out and all the statistics are revealed. The um, impetus for this anthology series was back in the days when the Sad Puppies movement was wreaking havoc on the Hugo Awards shortlist. The the ballot was just getting very skewed and very worthy pieces were getting kicked off by complete trash. Um, however, that's not really a problem anymore, but I still think the idea of this is quite nice. For me, it's been a good way to pick up print versions of some of my favorite stories of the year, so I'll keep backing the Kickstarters every year for as long as I'm getting what I want out of it. This particular one, I've already read almost all the stuff in it. I have four of the short stories to read and one of the novellas, um, Hammers on Bone by Cassandra Kaw, which I'm actually very curious about. I've never really read much of her stuff before that I can remember. It's very nice and it's very it's very like high quality anthology so I would recommend it if you're looking for something with this kind of idea. This next book comes courtesy of somebody who's been very kind to me this year and it is a copy of New York 2140 by Kim Stanley Robinson. So thank you very much Andrea. Um, the rest of you guys will recognize her as infinite text down in the comments. Um, so yes, this is one of my favorite books of the year. I'm pretty sure it's gonna make it to my top 10 list. I still haven't quite crunched the numbers on everything yet, um, but I'm so happy I have a copy of this. And it fits the beautiful books theme. I really like the cover art on this. It is a wonderful imagining of New York, mostly flooded, of course, because of um, the, the topic of the book. The cover art is by Stefan Martinier. Martinier um, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his name, but I recognize his name and I recognize his art style. I think he's very well known um, for doing cover art for science fiction and fantasy. It is very detailed, like if you look very up close, there are so many details. I love looking at it. And it is about um, a future New York City that has been completely flooded, climate change, rising ocean levels. And it's got a very complicated plot, lots of moving pieces, but it's basically a group of people trying to um, create a financial revolution in the United States. <laughs> but there's a lot more to it than that. Um, so if you love info dumping, near future, climate driven science fiction, why not? I'm gonna try to get my dad to read this one very soon. So he will probably be the first person to crack open this particular copy. <laughs> it seems it seems fitting for some reason, but anyway, thank you once again, Andrea. It was an absolutely wonderful gift and I cannot thank you enough. <laughs> Next up is Summer and Orcus by T. Kingfisher, whose real name is Ursula Vernon. Um, this is a novel that she originally serialized for free on her website at the end of 2016. It's still available there if you wanna go read it. I read the first chapter and then decided to hold out for a print edition because I was pretty sure there would be a nice one. And not surprisingly, Sofa Wolf Press, who has published Verna's work in the past, ran a Kickstarter to do this edition and I'm glad I waited. It is absolutely beautiful. I'm actually not sure if the colors on this come through very well on my camera. My um, color correction is kind of screwed up with the lighting today, uh, but I, I got it. I pulled it out of the box and was like, Whoa, I love the colors of this one. So the cover design as well as the illustrations inside are done by Lauren Henderson and it is it is really, really beautiful. This is about a perfectly ordinary 11 year old girl named Summer with a perfectly ordinary, needy, overprotective single mother. Um, who She goes on an adventure with Baba Yaga and her magical walking house. Um, and finds herself transported to the strange world of Orcus with nothing but a weasel in her pocket. <sighs> that, that phrase right there, weasel in her pocket, that's Vernon in a nutshell. <laughs> the remaining books I'm going to show you pretty quickly are all Christmas gifts that I received from a very wonderful family and an awesome secret Santa. So first up is the coolest looking book ever. 
This is Collected Fiction by Elena Crone. It's very shiny and I'm trying to not have too much glare. Is this not a gorgeous shade of blue? I have been dying to read this based on just the cover design and the spine is also really cool. Um, this is published by Cheeky Frog Books, which is um, run by uh, Jeff and Anne Vandermeer. I've of course read books by Jeff Vandermeer, but I haven't read that much of um, the work that Anne Vandermeer has edited. This is like all of Lena Crone's work that has been translated into English. It contains a couple of novels, some novellas, and short fiction. Crone is a very well-regarded Finnish speculative writer, I believe. I've read a couple of the stories in this because they've been in various places before and I loved them. So I'm very much looking forward to this. And this does beg a question that I've never, I've never had before, which is that um, if I read a collection that contains novels but also short stories, do I just count the one omnibus that I've read or do I like break out the individual novels and mark them as read on Goodreads? But I'm the type of person that I always mark individual titles as read when I'm reading them in an omnibus and not just the omnibus itself because I want to track which titles and how many titles I've read by an author. But this is a mix because it contains novels and short fiction. And I don't know. I don't know. Um, the other thing I'd mention is that on the inside, this is also very well done. Sometimes I just open up a book and I think, wow, it's so well done inside. Like the chapter pages are done well, the text is very clean, and there's enough space on every page and stuff. It's just, it's very tight and clean feeling and I, I love it. And once again, that shade of blue is amazing and it makes my face look more normal in this light. <laughs> then my parents got me a couple of books. The first one is The Art of Language Invention by David J. Peterson. This is the book on creating realistic invented languages. Peterson is, as far as I know, the only conlanger who's made a name for himself and kind of a career for himself inventing languages for television shows. He's done the languages for Game of Thrones, the six or so languages and writing scripts for Defiance, which was a, a sci-fi channel television show some years ago. And he did Triga Dasling for The 100, things like that. Um, I came to this because I have in the past, when I was a kid, been very interested in creating invented languages, very much inspired by Tolkien. And this book tells you how to create realistic seeming languages that aren't just codes, that aren't just like substitution ciphers in some way, but actual realistic grammar and evolution. And it's interesting not just because of the invented languages portion, but if you came to this just because you're interested in language, linguistics, grammar, it would also be really cool. And if you're just interested in, um, you know, languages from your favorite television show, that's also in here. Every chapter has a case study and getting into the guts of one of those languages that Peterson's created. And there's a whole phrase book at the end showing write writing scripts and stuff like that. So all around, a fascinating read, a very helpful one. And it's been quite a while since I have worked on any of my own language projects, but this kind of reignited that passion. I'll probably never share any of my own stuff, but I can highly recommend this if you are interested in the topic at all. It's, it's a really good and quite funny read as well. The other book that my parents got me is Akata Warrior by Neti Okorafor, which is the sequel to Akata Witch and another beautiful book. They did a new cover design for the first one which matches this and I'm so glad I haven't bought the first book yet. I'm gonna get a matching copy. Um, this art is by Greg Ruth. I know that name from somewhere. And the design is by Jim Hoover. It's it's really pretty. So this is a story that follows a Nigerian girl learning magic and kind of her, her destiny. What is she prophesied to do? And because it's Nnedi Okorafor, it's not your typical young adult fantasy. It is very different, especially culturally, and I'm really looking forward to it. I'd actually had this book pre-ordered earlier in the year and I canceled my pre-order when I was trying to be a bit better about my book spending budget. So thank you, parents. <laughs> 
And very quickly, the last two books I have to show you I got from the Secret Santa gift exchange that the BookTube SFF Voxer group did this year. I participated in this time. And my Secret Santa was Sean from Eclectic Reads. And even though we don't really know each other, he managed to pick the two books that I was seriously considering buying for myself next from my book depository wish list. The first one is D.G. Compton's The Continuous Catherine Mortenhoe, which I initially had little interest in, but Joe from Final Blow Joe did a review of it this year, and all of a sudden I was like, that sounds like a very interesting book, and it's been on my priority list to get. Um, so it says on the back, a few years in the future, medical science has advanced to the point where it is practically unheard of for people to die of any cause except old age. The few exceptions provide the fodder for a new kind of television show for avid audiences who lap up the experience of watching someone else's dying weeks. So when Catherine Mortenhoe is told that she has about four weeks to live, she knows it's not just her life she's about to lose, but her privacy as well. This sounds like invasive reality television when you're dying. Such a horrible idea, but I bet it's going to be a very interesting read. The other book that Sean got me is the vintage Red Spine edition of Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose, which I read earlier this year and loved. It has a labyrinthine library in it, guys. This is a book for book lovers, for, for library lovers. It's also historical fiction. It's wonderfully written. The details are so rich and the mystery is, is great as well. One that I wanted to own a copy of because I know I will reread it at some point. So it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> I don't know who does the artwork on these. Co cover illustration by Petra Bonner. I think it's, it's very, very lovely. And that is it for this book haul of things that I have read and not read. Beautiful books with wonderful insights. Let's just appreciate how wonderful books are as a physical object for a moment. I mean, reading them is great, but there's, there's the pleasure of that particularly well put together book as well. Anyway, if there are any of these that I haven't read yet that you have and you think I should prioritize them, please let me know in the comments down below. Let me know what you got for Christmas if you've got books for Christmas. And I will talk to you again very soon, probably in 2018 and until the next year. Bye. I am seriously going to regret trying to hold all these up, aren't I? Okay. It's like weightlifting for book lovers.